Welcome to the Doctors Hospital Distinguished Lecture Series. Every month we invite members of our medical community to speak on topics that matter to you, the Bahamian public. We trust that you will find this information useful. Now sit back, listen and learn. Isn't your health worth it? This topic is extremely important. As we develop the topic, you will see why I'm saying it's very, very important. I have no disclosures. No insurance company have given me any money to present this talk. No pharmaceutical industry has given me any money. I'm not paid off. This is something so important because in our population, it's taking over. Stroke has taken over. And um, I think it's important, thanks to Jessica and the marketing department, um, she's the chief, um, for highlighting the importance of this topic. As a professor, I think it's very, very important that our people be aware of what we're trying to accomplish here. And no further questions and no further comments, we go straight to the material. Primary spontaneous non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage. That means the hemorrhage happens, no warning, is not due to trauma, means not due to accident, is not due to two by four hit on the head, it's not due to fall, no trauma. You're just sitting in your restroom, you're just sitting in the dining room, you're just talking to your friends in the church, and suddenly you collapse. So that's what we call spontaneous. And of course, it's a bleed into the brain tissue itself. That's why it's a problematic. It's not under the bone, it's not under the towel that covers the, the brain itself, but it's inside the brain tissue. And then, um, but depending on the quantity or the amount of the blood, it may extend to nearby areas in the brain. The head might look small, but it's just like you're traveling a million miles. That's how difficult it is to move from here to here. Because the good Lord has made in such a way is a compartment, secured compartment. Like you have a house, you put the best padlock and you throw away the key. And that's how it's made. So that nobody should get there. But they say whoever has the enigma has the key. So I guess the good Lord made it, but also give us the key so that whenever it's necessary, we can open a little bit. So this is why this, this kind of stroke is very important. So what he's explaining here is that when you have that clot, it can pull and tear, you know, and some of the blood can enter into the pool of the brain. And that is, as you can see later, will cause a lot, a lot of trouble. A lot of blockage, a lot, a lot of trouble is going to cause once you get to the pool of the brain. So now you may wonder why this is almost very fatal. Once you don't, if you don't catch it in time, you don't get to the hospital in time, you have no chances. Just think of what I've explained to you. These are the key words. By the time we finish this topic, these are things you're going to know. Spontaneous, I've explained to you, has no warning. Just eating your breakfast, boom, spontaneous. Hypertensive, high blood pressure. Intracerebral hemorrhage means brain bleed inside the brain tissue. Neurosurgery is a practice of brain and spine. Intracranial pressure means the pressure inside the head. And Princess Margaret Hospital is that hospital there. <laughs> and Doctor's Hospital is this hospital here. And Glasgow Coma Scale is a scale, the neurological scale we use to see how you're doing. Are you going to survive? Are you not going to survive? You're going to be debilitated? That scale will tell us a lot when you get into the hospital. Now, this is a spot diagnosis. I have some of my young doctors here, seeing one of them, good doctor. Um, sometimes I put this in the scale and say, tell me what you're going to see next. You're going to choose whether it's A or whether it's B. And which of these CT scans would demonstrate 
a bleed from high blood pressure. I'll put A, then I'll put B. Now, for you, no, this is not your concern, because after all, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to read scam for you to know that. But for those who are watching in television, who are doctors, they probably should start thinking that. You see the first one? A is a bleed caused by malformation that can resume and like arterial venous malformation. I'm going to explain that now for you. When we are born, we are perfectly made. But sometimes you have a deficiency, a defect in the arteries. You have a defect in these things that run like spaghetti. You have a defect in them. That means the, their layers are so soft and fragile. If you cough, it might rupture. I don't mean you're going to rupture with coughing, but that's how fragile it is. So usually they cannot withstand stress in life. As you grow older, start working, have to catch the bus, have to catch the train, whatever we're doing, have to take the kids to school, no money in the bank, stress builds up. These capillaries, we call them, we know withhold the pressure. And they will leak easily because of the way they are made. Naturally, a normal vessel will end up in fine vessels. But the fine vessels will be so perfect that the other fine vessel, the other side will join together like finger to finger. That's the usual way. But in this case, if you look, this is called arterial venous malformation, a malformation between the arteries and the veins. That's a big word, but if you join them, that's what it means. So in that situation, here, it's not supposed to be that way. If you look, it looks like spaghetti. So if the pressure goes high, boom, it ruptures and bleeds. It's similar to aneurysm. It's a sister of aneurysm. The difference is in arterial venous malformation, it's like spaghetti. Bad vessels joined together. An aneurysm is a single bubble, like you have a grapefruit. And that grapefruit in, your, in the artery keeps increasing inside like a balloon until the pressure goes out, it explodes. That's aneurysm keys quickly, just like arterial venous malformation. But these are structural problems people are born with. I repeat, whether it's aneurysm, or arterial venous malformation, you are born with that. The problem, as you grow older and older, they get bigger and bigger and more fragile and more fragile until they ruptures. Any questions so far? It's important for me to understand the difference. But now, if you look at this side, the answer is B, of course, because we're talking about stroke caused by pressure, high blood pressure, not taking your medication, not complying to doctors, not doing exercise, putting excessive weight, taking too much salt. So that one causes your blood pressure to be high. 200 over feet, 170, 300 over 120, and you're walking around like a time bomb. This is the one that's going to cause you this bleed. Look at how massive this bleed is. Follow the arrow. So in exam for those doctors, they ask you, what do you think? This is from structural damage, like arterial venous malformation, malformation between artery and vein, or aneurysm. And this is hematoma or blood clot caused by hypertension. Now, the overview of this topic, this is like when you, when you want to know something in life, you probably ask a lot of questions. Have you done this surgery before? How many people suffered from this illness? Which hospital am I going to do this surgery? Am I going to get rehab after this surgery? So many questions are asked. In, this, in the same property, in the same way, you have to ask questions. How many people suffer from hemorrhage from blood pressure anyway? It's telling you that. 37 to 52,000 people in the United States have it every year. <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of people. And, and the rate is expected to double in 50 years. 
because of an increasing age of population and changes in racial demographics. Means we're getting older and older and older. As we do that, thank God, the pressure, you know. Young people don't get blood pressure. Only old people like us get blood pressure. <laughs> so, so as we get older, we're going to have it. And then, of course, as the topic increases, you will know why racial demographics, why it's more frequent in our black population. And um, when I say black population, I want you to know that in the Caribbean, there's nothing like white or black. Even if you're white, you trace, there may be some trace of blackness. And even if you're dark like me, you probably have some white. Who knows? <laughs> so, so in that situation, don't think because you know, you're black, 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 is only for you. And you, you white, white, white is not for you. I would think everybody should think about this as every people disease, especially in the Caribbean. But the statistics says the darker skin you have, the more you have this problem. Because it's believed that it's more frequent in black people and from Asia, Japan, China. I will tell you why they think that too about them. And um, as you see, the mortality is very high, 10 to 15 percent will die if you have that, because this accounts for all strokes. And um, if you have this amount of deaths, actually this statistic is low, to be frankly, you know, only 38 percent of people who have this will survive in the first year. Isn't that amazing? You get interest labor hemorrhage, only 38% of people who get it will survive the first year. It's not a joke. And depending on the underlying cause, it can be primary or secondary. I've already explained that. A primary interest labor hemorrhage or hemorrhage in the brain tissue, we call it primary, which contributes almost 88% of cases because it is not it originates from the spontaneous rupture of small vessels damaged by chronic hypertension. The vessel I showed you in the board, usually they are very small. If you have pressure all your life, those vessels are damaged. They become fragile. That's why blood pressure is your enemy. You may, it's called a silent killer because you may not know you're suffering from it and it's killing you gradually. So how is it killing you? Because the blood vessels are being damaged day after day after day until at a critical point, it ruptures. So that's called primary intracerebral hemorrhage. But you have a secondary one. Secondary one is easy. I always tell people secondary to what? That's how you know it. Secondary to trauma? Did I have any trauma? Secondary to a brain tumor? Do I have, no, secondary to aneurysm, which I showed you, or arterial venous malformation. Secondary to impaired coagulation. Maybe you had a heart disease, and your doctors give you Coumadin, Pradaxa, Serota, and you take it, take it, and it overcoagulates, thins your blood too much, you might bleed. Is it secondary to that? No. What is it? It's primary because, essentially because of your blood pressure. So we have already discussed that, and everybody's aware of what we're talking about now. So if you're not aware before I enter the topic, it's going to get more difficult and sweeter. So you let me know now. But this is introduction of the topic we're going to deal with. To summarize briefly before I enter further, is a bleed in the brain tissue that is caused by blood pressure. That's what it is. Now, you have other bleeds that can happen in the brain tissue, like a heart aneurysm, like you have arterial venous malformation, like they thin your blood too much. All those things can happen. But usually, what we're dealing today, because of the incidents, how frequent blood pressure in this country, we want, to know, want people to know it requires a public announcement. 
You want to prove me wrong? Walk to PMH. I have 10 people with this lying down. I have two here, as we speak. Old, young, not so old, not so young. So that's why I want to summarize that everybody knows why we're here today. And I want, when you live here, I want you to grab that in your mind. This is not a social gathering. Yes, it is. But it's a social gathering towards your education, towards your health. And thanks to Doctor's Hospital. We go back again. This is what we call the worldwide incidence. In every 100,000, you should have about 24.5. That's the most recent literature. Every 100,000, 25 people are sick with this. And it's a little bit more common in men than women, because men are always stressed out. <laughs> All right? And, and once, you're, once you're older than 55 years, watch out. And in Japan, the statistics is much, much more. And then blacks. Like I say, in the Caribbean, you don't have pure blacks. Trust me, you don't. I had a patient one day, darker than me by three shades. And we took a blood to check something. He has a disease of the white man. Only found Europe. So you tell me how is that black? <laughs> and I have another patient as white as a snow that has sickle cell anemia. And you know you're not supposed to have him white, right? So, so I say to say, you've got to pay attention to this topic. Anyway, this is really the, yeah, that's the word to use. I've been trying to remember that word. So in Japan, you have 55 per 100,000 people. And people believe probably due to alcohol use or due to low level of cholesterol. You see, cholesterol is good if you have it good. When you have it too high, it causes heart attack and brain attack. I use the word brain attack. That's a new nomenclature what you go home with. Brain attack. <laughs> Stroke is a brain attack. So if you have a brain attack, like stroke, you know, it's believed that cholesterol can be part of it. But when it's too low, it's believed to cause problems. Look at in Japan, for example. So this is a Bahamian study. You guys are favored, because you'll be the first to see this study. This study is going to be published in the American Association of Neurological Society and the World Congress. We're going to be the first people to see this study. This study is done for 20 years, 20 years study. You can imagine the effort put in for this study. Since 1997, I've been doing this study. And it concluded last year, 2017. And this is objective methods and results. Now the objective is to demonstrate the prevalence of high blood pressure stroke. Put it that way, instead of me to say intracerebral hemorrhage caused by hypertension. High blood pressure stroke in the Bahamas. Now, the only two hospitals we have will be Princess Margaret and Doctor's Hospital at Tertiary. We have one around, but they don't have a neurosurgeon in house. So I cover around. That means if you have problems like that in Rand, they're going to come down here. And some islands, if your family, you have clinics. But if you took ill, they have to get a charter flight or an ambulance and bring you here. Yes, I remember that. Now, the secondary objective is to compare if you do surgery and if you don't do surgery. Do you have any benefit? We're going to look into it. And all the patients we looked into are either admitted at Princess Margaret or Doctor's Hospital or transferred from Ram Memorial Hospital to either of the hospitals. A 20-year study period, I've told you that, and a total of 1,258 patients were involved in the study. It's a lot of people. 
and you have 832 patients who are treated surgically. I have to do surgery on that amount. If I can do surgery in amount of that bleed for blood pressure, can you imagine other surgeries I do? There's a lot of surgeries, eh? So, but this is too much. And you have 426 patients who are treated non-surgically. Give them medication, you follow them ICU, you stay with them, you have to preach, you have to do whatever you need to do to them. They get well. The methods, the data we are collected, we have patient records, we have surgical logbooks, we have annual consultant ward round registry, which a book I have, date of admission, diagnosis you have when you get inside, what plan do I have for you? If God gives you life, you leave the hospital, I put date of discharge. And accidental emergency admission logbook. When you enter an emergency, your name is taken. Initial diagnosis is taken. Maybe wrong, but something is taken. And surgical treatment include what we call the compressive craniotomies. I will teach you guys when we get there. It means take out the brain, take out the bone completely, and drain the clot, or put a pressure monitoring to see what's going on. And of course, it can do both. Monitor, take off fluid from the coconut water, I told you before, drain the clot, and store the bone in the belly. I devised that technique, by the way. It's a short story, but it's a, it's a good story for me. In 97, I was looking for where to put the bone, somebody's bone. Because it wasn't too good to throw it away. If I have to remove a piece of the skull so big like that, where do I keep it after? Because I can't put it back because the brain swells out. It swells really out like a dough. So if you put it, it can't even fit anymore. So what do you do with it? I decide, you know what, I'm not going to throw the bone away. I made incision in the belly, and I buried the bone there. And guess what? That bone survived better than anywhere in the world. I'm giving classes everywhere in the world because of that. So that bone can stay there forever. Not calling names. I have prominent behaviors. I did that. They never want to come back to theater. They say, Doc, God gave me this life. Leave the bone there. And they put their hair tie, cover it up. You never know. I'm serious about what I'm saying. But usually what should happen would be after six weeks, that swelling should have gone down. You take them back, fish the bone out, and put it back. Well, these are the patients that are involved in this, in this study. But these are not included. Because they are not included because they have the same reasons. Sometimes they don't come to us. Sometimes they went overseas. And sometimes they recovered at home or died at home. Some of, some of them are misdiagnosis. And the visitors or tourists are not included. They are not Bahamians. So it can, be, it can represent what we're looking for. So the truth of the matter, therefore, is that we have more cases. The cases that don't come to me, that go straight from Freeport to to Memorial or to Jackson. I don't see them. So that means this number you're going to see tonight may even be higher. And these are the results of the study before we enter into the meat of it. If you do surgery for these people, it's much better for them. Especially if the Glasgow Coma Scale is six. And Stroke caused by hypertension score is less than two. Now, I'm going to break things down for you because this is like a professorial teaching. I got to come down. Glasgow Comaske, Glasgow is in Scotland. Is a test which was 
invented, I would say, by two professors. Professor Jeanette is a great professor. And I'm Professor Braham, 1974. Guess why they developed this scale? Before they developed this scale, it's called neurological scale, if you come to the hospital and you fall in coma, or you have headache, you have all kinds of problems, the nurse will come and examine you and say, you're uptunded. You know what uptunded means? You're sleeping. The young doctor will come, you know what? He's sleeping. He's not uptunded like that. The consultant will come and say, you know, maybe he's too pros. These are English words. Too pros may deeper. Deeper. Or light coma. Maybe the chief comes and says, you're in the deep coma. So everybody is different. I mean, these two professors, Graham and Jeanette, they say, how can every single doctor who sees, even nurse, the same patient have a different opinion about her? Can we get to a consensus and write a neurological scale whereby a medical student, a nursing student, a nurse, a professor, who have the same scale. Can we do that? And they wrote the scale. Because it's written in Glasgow, which is Scotland. It's called Glasgow comma scale. And now, that scale has the highest value of 15 points. So if you score 15 points, it's called 15 over 15. You have the maximum. You can't get more than that. That means I have 15, you have 15. If you are a dead person, in your grave, you have three. So there is no two, there is no one, there is no zero. So when you hear the word three, it means you're almost dead or dead. If you hear the word 15, you think about yourselves. So now you know the upper and the lower limit. You follow me now, this important scale. For you to get that scale, you have three parameters. Best motor response. I will explain that. Best eye response and best verbal or mouth response. That's the way it is. If it's best motor response, we're taking one now, one line. If you obey orders, I say close your eyes, you're lying in, in the bed and I see you. I come there. Mary, close your eyes for me. You close it. Open your eyes. No, sorry. Mary, show me your tongue. Give me a thumb. Lift your hand up. You are obeying my commands. You get a six. You can't get more than that. Six for that line. If I come to you, you don't do this. But you localize his pain. I pinch you a little bit. You snap me as if, what is wrong with this guy? So I give you a five. If I come to you, flesh on withdrawal, I pinch you. You do not beat me up, but you flex. It means that you have pain. I give you a four. If I come to you, I pinch you, or I look at you, you're having abnormal flexion, rigidity. means you're rigid in abnormal sense. Your hand like that, your legs like that, and you're sweaty. Time to run. Problem is coming on your way. I give you a two. And when I come there, you have like a motor bicycle rider. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So the hand like that, the leg like that, you're extremely rigid, you're sweaty. I give you one point. It's called decelebration. If you don't do nothing, 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 I give you one. You don't have zero because there's no zero. <coughs> now that's best motor response. Remember it's line six, five, four, three, two, one. The next scale is best mouth or verbal response. I come to you, we're conversing. What happened to you? I was in the church, man. See what happened to me? 
Mm -hmm. And what date is today? You tell me. What is your name? You tell me. Where are you now? You tell me. That means you're oriented. Person, yourself, place, and time. I gave you five. It's not six. Six is for that, the first one. This is five, maximum. But if you're conversing with me and you are confused, means you don't know today's date, or you don't remember where you are, but you're conversing, I give you a four. But if you're saying things, I ask you, what did you have for breakfast? You say in Market Street. <laughs> <laughs> that means inappropriate words. I give you a three. But if I see you and you mumbling to yourself, nobody can comprehend what you say. That's what you say, incomprehensible sounds. I give you a one. There's no zero again. That's for your mouth. Mouth is important in life. Mouth. What about the eyes? Best verbal, best eye response. Eye. That's why eyes is very important. People never think how important the eyes are. They ne they, we never treat us whether you're smelling something now or whether you're hearing something. You're saying eyes. If I come to your bedside, you have your eyes wide open. Open eyes spontaneously. I give you a four. If I have to tell you, um, Susan, Susan, open your eyes for me, you do open your eyes. I give you a three. Means you open it by verbal command. If you don't do that, I pinch you, you open your eyes, I give you a two, because you open it by pen. If you don't open at all, I give you one. So when you sum it, six, five, four, three, two, one. This is five, four, three, two, one. This is four, three, two, one. If you add the top ones, it gives you 15. If you add one, 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 it gives you three. That's why I say maximum you can ever get is 15, and minimum you can ever get is three. So now you can read that. If you come to the hospital and you have a six, do you think you're sick or you think you're normal? Sick. You're very, very sick. 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 If the maximum is 15, you only have six. Remember now you're, the minimum is three. Remember, you don't have two, you don't have one, you don't have zero. So you only three points to death. <laughs> and of course, the interest liberal hemorrhage score, that's a different score. This is not Glasgow. But this tells you about your age. If you are 80 or less than 80, you get zero point. If you are more than 80, you get one point. This is a different scale now. It's important. I'll tell you why. If the amount of blood in your brain, when I do a scan, so much blood. That means it's more than 30 cubic centimeter, like a half cup. You get a one. If it's less, you get a zero. Or the scan shows that the blood is in the pool, the lake of the brain, the coconut water. It's not good, you're getting a point. If it's not there, you're getting a zero. Or that the blood is at the back of your head. Remember the old people say, don't hit somebody here? That's, don't do it. That's center of death. Because if the blood is this side, you get a one. If you don't have it this side, you get a zero. And of course, if your Glasgow comma scale, which I have already discussed, is more than six, you get a zero. If it's less than six, you get a one. When you add up these, is about five of them, the maximum you can get is seven. The minimum is zero. So in this case, the higher you go, the worse for you. Whereas in Glasgow Comma Scale, the higher you go, the better for you. I will teach you, we're going to get as we get there. Now, surgical treatment is less favorable, though, if this score is more than four, the score I've just described with you. If it's more than four, you're in trouble. <laughs> but of all these patients we have treated, all of them have high blood pressure. That's the reason. They have diabetes. They have sugar. They are obese. They need to lose weight. And they have high cholesterol. Does that make sense? 
course, we know that men are stressed out all the time. But look at the, the female are not very far behind. It's not even up to one is to two. And if I do surgery on these people, they stay 21 days, three weeks in hospital. If I don't, they stay more than a month. You may think it's a month, but if you stay a month in hospital, do you know problems that are going to happen to you? First, their money will run out if you pay. If you don't get pneumonia, don't get all kinds of problems, nosocomial infections, bed sores. It's a lot of time to be 35 days in hospital. And the average mortality in our study is 31.5%. So of all those 1258 patients we did, 31.5 died. Now you might think it's high, but you check, you check the world population, the average mortality up to 50%. So we're doing great. This problem is costly and devastating. And surgical treatment is promising if you handle it promptly. And medical treatment still have a big role to play because you can't do surgery in all of them. And neuro rehabilitation, as Jessica was saying, is a key to improvement. You may do the fantastic surgery you want to do. You may do everything you want to do. You need to do rehab, my brother, my sister. If you don't do rehab, oh, you basically have wasted all your time. Because he needs somebody to teach you again how to speak, help you to move around, help you to use your hands, call occupational, feed yourself, be independent again. That's the job of speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physiotherapy. <laughs> Sorry about that. It may be a good idea for the Bahamas to be a referral center in the Caribbean for this study, because this is the first of its kind. And I believe um, similar studies has to be done, like in Jamaica, in Trinidad, to see the trend would be, if you do it the best, you become a referral center. Um, I bet you not so many people have done that amount of surgeries about stroke. So that's why we want to do these studies or ask our colleagues in the rest of the Caribbean to do these studies, to see how much they have, how many people they have, and where we go from there. Now, this is the prevalence. And this is year by year. It's self explanatory. The only thing I could say is that if you look at 1998, you see, you have as low as 29 years. Somebody took now with this kind of problem. And if you look at this, it continues, of course. You have 32. And the most important thing is, look at the numbers. 74 in a year. And this is a graph. Speaks volumes. See, that initially, this male, female, female, male, look at how the way are close by, look close by, the male jump. No money in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this, the total number anywhere is going to the sky. And this is admission PMH versus doctors. And you can see the gray one, of course, PMH. This is doctors. Topographically, to represent in the brain surface, means you can have this bleed any part of your brain. It does not matter. Any part of your brain, you can have it. But 
conclusively, this in percentage, the overall percentage, you have more here. Put them in global value, number 25, here. This is where you have most of the bleed. It's called basal ganglia, thalamus. But you can have it in any part of your brain. This is how it's classified. And this is that back side of the brain I told you not to touch. Brain stem is only one. But if you have it, it's fatal. And these are the risk factors, which I've just said. Diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, non-compliance, alcohol. Let's talk about non-compliance. We are killing ourselves because of foolishness. If you see a doctor, and your doctor tells you you have high blood pressure, and you need to take medications, why would you not do it? I mean, why would you say you're not claiming it? Why would you say that? Your body is registering that. It's your body that is registering that. <laughs> because if you don't do that, remember what I said? Those tiny vessels try to break down little by little by little. Silent killer means you feel great until you drop dead. Non-compliance is a problem in the Bahamas, in everything. That's why specifically I put it here. There's not like non-compliance in medicine, but I put it here. Because of all the patients I have gotten that have this disease, 90% of them stop somehow to take medications. Doc, guess what happened? I did it for two months, my pressure is good now, I don't need to take it. Once, well, guess what happened? Once you have high blood pressure, once you have cholesterol, once you have sugar, it's a lifelong problem. Take a pill in the morning and live 100 years old. Eh? Or then take it and die 40. It's not a problem to take a pill. And for men, sometimes they think, you know, you're going to make them lose their impotency. Well, let me tell you about impotence. I prefer being impotent than alive. I use my brain to do something for myself. <laughs> because you are, you are potent, but you're dead anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another caveat. There's another caveat. If you are impotent, there are medications you can use to help you. You see urologists. There are tons of them now. I give you names. <laughs> And don't drink too much alcohol because you see you face that problem too. In the olden days, when you don't have somebody like me, if you have a clot in the brain, if medicine cannot help you, bye bye. Because there was no surgeon to do that. So that's why the trend was really low. You see, it was low here. And it keep going here. It means we start to practice surgery more and more and more and save more lives and more lives and more lives. Another problem I have, oh, unless they come in coma dying, the family always say, you sure you want to do surgery? Sometimes I just, they just say, you know what, I have, my mom always teach me something. Everybody knows that story that, you know, God will take care of me, right? Mm -hmm. And you're a fisherman, right? Mm -hmm. And you're both sunk, right? Mm -hmm. And the water is here, right? Mm -hmm. You see somebody passing by, the Lord will save my life. Leave me. The man guy, come on. He said, go. <laughs> the Lord will save my life. The, wa the water starts reaching to your chest. <laughs> you see another yacht. Poo. The Lord promised me I'm not drowning. He is there for me. The water reaches here. You see another person passing to help you. You refuse. A helicopter was passing while your water is 
The Lord said, I'm not dying today. And the man died. He went to heaven, right? He didn't get to heaven at the door, the big door there. He said, God, I'm disappointed in you. You are the one who promised me I will never die, that you take care of me. The Lord said, you fool. I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a ship. I sent you a... What else you want? You're a fool. That's why you died. So, guess what? We do what we do because I think the Lord wants us to do that. So when you see yourself in trouble, just have to trust your doctor. Because sometimes, another literature, I like to read a lot. I know you guys like to read a lot too. But there are some I read in Julius Caesar, Shakespearean literature. He say a coward die many times before they are dead. And the violent only test death but once. I'm not saying you should be radical now. <laughs> but what that tells you is too much, you could, you could die getting afraid of yourself. If you're afraid too many times, you may die. A coward die many times before they are dead. If you're brave, the time comes, that's when you die. Doesn't mean you should be radical. You should always have a good judgment. But there's nothing wrong doing surgery in these things, especially if you know the guy has done it multiple times. And you do your homework. You Google and see the person that's doing the surgery anywhere. So this life we live in today is like our life is a book, open book. You can't hide nothing on this earth. So, but once you take your blood pressure and you do what you have to do, but unfortunately you get this problem, we can help you. And these are the type of surgeries we do. I've explained that to you again. The, the biggest amount of surgeries we do is this one. You know what that means? Make a ball hole and put a drain in that coconut water, the pool. You see the drain in the bag outside with blood. And you'll be reading your pressure in the brain. Ding, 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 ding. Because the pressure in the brain is essential. Why? Because of what I'm going to tell you now. It's called the law of Moro and Kelly. I know some of you are teachers and principals and professors in your field. That law says whatever is inside your skull is constant. Because the skull is fixed. It does not expand. So what are these things inside the skull? One is the brain tissue. One is a blood that has to supply your brain. And one is a coconut water, the fluid in the brain. That's what you have inside. I repeat, you know what you have inside this thing? Three. You have the brain matter. You have the blood. Of course, you've got to have blood to flow in the arteries and veins. And you have the coconut water, the water in your brain. So what the law says, Moro and Kelly, that Three of these things are in equilibrium. The nature is there. The, the good Lord has made them. Don't change it, please. But if you have to change one of them, put it up, you have to decrease one of the two so that you always be in equilibrium. For example, it goes in everything, in brain tumor, in everything. That's a, a great law in neurosurgery. If you're going to be a brain surgeon, you better know this law. What that means if you, somebody bleeds in his brain or her brain from high blood pressure, you're creating something that's not supposed to be there. The clot is not supposed to be there. That means you're putting additional thing inside the skull. And the skull cannot expand to accommodate anything. It's fixed. So what do you think will happen? The law says you better decrease the size of the brain or you better decrease the water flowing in your brain or you better decrease the blood supply to your brain. That's what the law says. So that you can accommodate this new comma, which is a nuisance. But you're not going to go nowhere. You can't decrease the brain tissue because you're killing yourself. You may decrease the blood that flows to your brain, but that's not good. It gives more stroke because you need blood to supply food <coughs> to the brain. Or you may decrease the water that flows to the brain. That's what we normally do. That's the first one. 
And that water is pushed out through your eyes everywhere. And when the doctor looks into your eyes, your eyes boy is swollen. You see seeing bloody vision. You're not seeing clear. That's the first physiology. The next physiology, okay, this clot is too much. The skull is not going nowhere. We are in trouble. We're dying. You know what happened? Boom. The blood supply in the brain shuts off to decrease the quantity. That's what the law says. You've got to maintain the equilibrium. Now, that is going to lead to more stroke, eh? But guess what happened? After that, the clot is still bigger and bigger. Then your brain starts to push through your neck. Squash. Mash up. Because it has to decrease to maintain the equilibrium. How fortunate that is. That, that simple law explains everything that happens. So what we do is we artificially go make a hole, put a drain in the pool to decrease that so that we can give room for the clot. Aha, you see why we do that? But that also we monitor the pressure that is in the brain. If that is not helping, we go to the second step, take out the whole bone out so that the brain can now create artificial room. We're going to create more room so that this law can be null and void. Because if we don't create a room for you, the brain is going to mash up. Crack. And the next thing we do, apart from doing the cranial, I mean, means removing the bone, I dissect something under, your, under the scalp and use it to sew the towel that covers the brain to aggrandize, to augment the towel so that your brain can sit comfortably when it swells. And of course, sometimes I do it, I do all of them, A, B, C, and D together in one surgery, because I think the stroke is too much, and I put the bone in the belly. So these are the numbers of people we did. Each one is different. And that results to this amount of surgeries in these stroke people. This is only trying to tell you the most one we do is to monitor the pressure in the brain by draining the fluid. Now, for me to do surgery on people, I don't just rush into doing surgeries. That's not essential. I got to examine you. I got to use this scale. Remember our famous our friend, Glasgow Coma Scale. I got to use it. I'm going to say, if they are 13 to 15, 15 is the highest, it's like us means they are fairly good. Surgery is only 27. No surgery is 12. But if they are 9 to 12, they are sicker people. They are getting very grave. Surgery jumped to 73. No surgery 46. But once they are 6 to 8, it's really critically sick. Looking at a dying man. Look at the amount of people. You've got to do surgery. You've got to rush now to save their life. And this we don't. And once they are less than 6, you see, it become more medical. Why? If they are less than C, because I don't feel, mm, that's that gray line. I think I've lost them. I think this surgery may not be meaningful. So it's not that we call everybody. You still have to do our homework, evaluate, and look at the situation. So when the doctor tells you you need surgery, don't think he just saw you. No, he has done this evaluation. Now, this, this table is probably the most important table here for everybody. This is telling me, of all these people I did, this is the result. Five excellent or favorable outcome means you walk home as you came into the hospital. You walk home as you what? You came into the hospital. This is it. And a good number of people. If you have four, it means you're good. You have a mind deficit able to return to pre-morbid work or lifestyle. If I give you four, it means you can go back to your insurance company where you work. You can go back as a teacher, the COB. You can go back as a fisherman, whatever you need to do, pre-morbid steps. But you might have a mind deficit, but you can hardly find it. it means these are stroke patients. I'm talking to them. You never knew their stroke unless you're a doctor. You never knew they had a stroke. But if you're a doctor, you might feel their mouth is a bit twisted. Mm. These are the kind of people here. 
Now, this is unfortunate here because this number three is not supposed to be here. But this is a word classification. So we do it, word classification, also give my opinion. We had about 326 fall into this scale. They say it's unfavorable, but I'm going to ask you a question. If you have a major stroke, you're not able to return to work, but you leave home with minimal assistance. To you, is that unfavorable? I'm just asking through it there. Right here. I want everybody to have their own opinion. This is the question. The question says, you had a stroke. You were discharged after the whole stroke. You were not able to return to your work. But you stayed at home. Read it. You leave your home with your family with minimal assistance. I'm asking you a question. Would you say that's unfavorable or would you say it's favorable? It's favorable. Good. I would think 90 people would say it's favorable, 90%. But the work classification thinks it's unfavorable because you're not able to go back to work. Now, in our population, these are the number of people, gigantic amount of them. We are able to live home with their family, go to church with minimal, look at minimal assistance. Simply they can't go back to work. Now, going back to work is very difficult. Because if it requires technical field, computer, you don't want to go back there to mess up. Maybe your family wants you to stay home. They want to take care of you. So I don't mind being in this state, God forbid, I don't want to have stroke, but this is not a bad situation. But now, the real unfavorable, I would think, would be these two. You have a significant deficit, means you have real problem, paralysis, it can't talk, it's speechless, nonverbal. You can't change your diapers. For me, that is unfavorable outcome. And number one, diseased. So these are the numbers. So if I put this number here, you see massive improvement. But if I leave this number here, you would think there's no much improvement. So this is it here. So excellent. Surgical, 344, fair, poor, or disease here, non-surgical, these are the results. But if you pick up this number here, 326, and put it under favorable, look at what? Jump right up. So this is the caution. A fair outcome is technically considered unfavorable. Technically. However, many consider a fair outcome to be favorable, like you just said. Therefore, we suggest that a favorable outcome should include excellent, good, and fair. And if you do that, the study suggestion becomes favorable 65% and favorable 35%. And this is the average hospital stay. Surgical, this is the number. Total number of surgical patients total number of non-surgical. I've told that before, 21 days if I did surgery, 35 days if I did not do any surgery. And this, I told you I'm going to come back here again, but I'm here again now to remind you that. It's called intracerebral hemorrhage score, or stroke caused by hypertension. This is the score we get in six months. Means how, what happened to those people that suffered a stroke six months ago? This score is, for me, is very important. This is how we calculate them. If your Glasgow comma scale, we use it. If it's 13 to 15 is a good score, you have a zero. In this case, the lower the number, the better for you. If you have 5 to 12, you have a 1, 3 to 4, you have a 2. If the volume of blood, if the clot in the brain tissue is, is more than 30 pints, you have a 1, it's less than 0. If the blood is in that lake or coconut water area, you have 1. If you don't have it, you have a 0. If the blood is behind, in fratentoria means behind, you have a 1. If not, if it's here, you have a 0. If you're more than 80, one. If you're less than 80, it's zero. So what is it telling you? It's telling you that if you calculate this, 
This is an example. You have GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale 7. It's middle point. You are very sick, but you are not dead. We give you one point because we already said, we said here that if your Glasgow is 5 to 12, you have a 1. Three, dead or almost dead, you have a 2. Normal, you have 0. So if this guy has 7, 7 is within here. So we give him a point. So you give me a point, seven. ICH volume 28, we say if it's more than 30 pint, you give a one. If it's less, you give a zero. So it's 28 he has, that's the amount of clot in the brain, you give him a zero. If you have a blood in the lake or coconut water, you give a one. If you don't have, you give a zero. If he has one, you give a one. That's why we give one here. You have blood at the back of the head, you give a one. If you don't have, you give a zero. Now you say he has it, you give a one. Age is 79, you give a zero because if it's 80 or more, you give a one. If it's less than 80, you give a zero. So if you add the numbers, you have one, two, three. If you have a three, let's see how many people will die 30 day mortality in 30 days. Means that 30 days come, who is alive or who is dead? Let's see. We calculate it's true. 72% of every, all of them will die. Can you imagine that? 72%. If you have that score, three. And this is mortality in six months. And this is how it fluctuates. It used to be very high until we start to operate on them. Watch it start to stabilize. You can fairly say, if I catch you early and do surgery in the stroke, you go home. You can fairly say that. That's what this means. Unless they brought you too late. And conclusion, which is important, you can take a snapshot on that. In the Bahamas, the mortality in six months is 31.5%. Some studies reveal that the mortality for this disease is high and ranges between 30 to 50 percent. So we are not doing bad at all. And the regions of brain involved, I told you, is basal ganglia, which is that number 25. And if you have the back of the head, you're in trouble. And non-compliance is a major cause. We discuss non-compliance. And it's associated with Obesity, high cholesterol, and sometimes diabetes mellitus. It's a leading cause of death in our society. And if you have the ICS score, more than four, you barely you fairly die. All of them will die mostly. And surgical treatment will help a lot, a lot. And of course, the ratio between male and female is one is 1.68 to 1. 88% of all patients were admitted at Princess Margaret because it's a public hospital and 12 are doctor's hospital. That's safe explanatory. And the higher Glasgow you have, the better for you. And of course, I, I explain why fair outcome, 26% is fair outcome, which I think are favorable instead of unfavorable. And frankly speaking, a fair outcome is not a bad outcome. We already discussed that. We quiz it out. A vigorous acute rehab is necessary for stroke. We should stop going to Miami for this. There's a lot of money wasted abroad. The Mitchell Kidney Brain Injury Foundation is trying to gear towards a rehab. Meanwhile, we have a rehab here at Doctor's Hospital. There are a few things we have to help. A similar study should be done in the rest of the Caribbean countries to determine whether it's feasible for the Bahamas to be recognized as a referral center for stroke. A further investigation has to be done towards advantage of surgical treatment in early patients. 
It's important that we know where we live, how frequent is this disease. And this is what we do for people with stroke, recovering after stroke, rehab. A new thing called immobilization therapy. Means the side that is weak, the side that is good is immobilized so that it can force you to use the side that is weak. Can you imagine if you paralyze this side? I'm now holding you down this side, you can move. What does it do to you? It's trying to force the bad part to move. And of course, physiotherapy, which you know about, and occupational therapy, stroke, which you know about, which is a communication disorder, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and post-stroke spasticity. What that means to people who have stroke after six months, they can hardly extend their arm and leg. They become so stiff like that. Why do you think that is? Because nobody's moving them around. You have to move the articulations. Otherwise, they get stiff and rigid. We call that post-stroke spasticity. So you have to require a surgeon to cut your tendons and release them. To avoid that, you need a lot of therapy. Now, this is, before I, these are the references, but I'm going to show you some quick pictures. This is a man with stroke. That's a massive stroke here, basal ganglia. And this is after surgery. You can see there's no bone here now. See, this distance, the bone is missing. The bone is this one. Yeah? See, there's no bone here, it's missing. I took it out, it's here. This is a similar patient. He has a hole where the bone was removed. He gave me a helmet to wear just in case people hit his head, he'd be protected. And after I'm comfortable, I fish the bone and put it back. And this is a clot. This is their brain, and this is a clot squashed. You gotta remove all this cloth to make it clean like that. And this is another one. One of those younger people. And after I put it back, I give me a helmet, look at how it looks after I put the bone back. And this is a cloth here, a big time cloth, pushing the brain. And this cloth in different directions. Clot here, clot here. And this is the tube I told you about, the special tube we put and put it out. This is the pool of the brain. This black spot here is the pool. And this young man has a clot and after the surgery, look at how he looks. It's good. So I thank you guys for coming.